Pinball has been around for a while. Not always in the same form, but long enough to have seen countries rise, economies fall, and a lot of legislation passed which would make it illegal to play pinball. So get your quarters ready as we learn something new. Pinball was originally formed from a parlor game called Bagatelle. It was a way to create a game reminiscent of the extremely popular lawn games of the time, but for indoor use. To get the same fun indoors, the French invented the table in the late 18th century. It consisted of a wooden box, like a mini pool table, where you'd hit the ball around with a stick. The ball would bounce off the various pins stuck into the board, strategically placed so they'd form pockets with scores on them. The ball would land in these pockets, and your score would be whatever the pocket said. It shared few similarities to pinball in this form, as it didn't have flippers, nor did it use electricity. But in 1871, the British inventor Montague Redgrave decided to improve Bagatelle, going as far to take out a US patent for his new design. Redgrave made the game a lot more compact. He shrunk the table, replaced the balls with smaller marbles, and inclined the box. He also added a coiled spring and plunger, similar to the kind modern pinball machines use. Now, these Bagatelle tables were almost entirely based on luck. After you released the ball from the plunger onto the table, it was up to chance what your score would be, almost like a rudimentary form of Plinko, with pockets at different heights on the board. It wasn't until the 1930s that the first modern-looking coin-operated pinball machine was invented. It was created by the company Automatic Industries, which named it a Wiffle Board. Next up was a game called Ballyhoo, invented in the 1930s by Raymond Maloney. Later, Maloney would establish the Bali Manufacturing Company of Chicago, Illinois. All of these games were made with wooden legs and tables, which differ greatly to the pinball machines of today, which tend to be made of chrome and steel. Though, despite all these inventions in the early 1930s, none of them were given the name pinball. That wouldn't come about until 1936 when the term pinball was coined. But trouble was already beginning to brew. The Great Depression started in 1929, and you would have expected fun and games to die out during this time. But instead, pinball rose in popularity. This was because it was a low-cost game that anyone could play and get some respite from the hardships of everyday life. To keep people coming and playing, many pinball operators would give away prizes if people could get the high scores. This motivated players to cheat during pinball sometimes by doing everything they could to manipulate the outcome, taking the chance out of the game by picking up the table and shaking it. To counteract this, the tilt mechanism was invented in 1935 by Harry Williams. Today, pinball machines have two tilt devices, one for tilting from side to side and one for the slam tilt, when a player bangs the machine with their hand. Even the oldest pinball machines with the tilt mechanism had warnings built in. But now we get into the good stuff, when pinball was deemed a detriment to society. Pinball was made illegal for several reasons, some a bit more legitimate than others. You see, some began to see it as a form of gambling. While prizes for pinball games could win you a free game or some jewelry, there were no flippers to control, and so there was no skill involved. This would often lead to people betting against each other on where the ball would end up. Chicago became a mecca for pinball companies, producing the most pinball machines in the United States. It didn't help the industry's image with it being a popular game in a state so commonly associated with its gang activity. An estimated 1,300 gangs were present in Chicago by the mid-1920s. Parents started to fear this news of gambling in arcades as it spread throughout the United States. They began to see local arcades now as a casino entering their neighborhoods and local communities. As a result, parents began to lose trust in arcades as they worried about their kids wasting money on gambling. Some had feared that crimes would be committed due to the involvement of money, similar to casinos of the time. And it wasn't totally unwarranted. After the prohibition, which ended in 1933, Organized crime was taking root in many major cities across the United States, and these criminal organizations were looking for ways to racket and launder their money. This worked really well, because pinball didn't have a quantifiable product associated with it, like a pack of cigarettes would have. It was impossible for someone to accurately track the machine's earnings from the outside, meaning it was far less traceable. Not to mention that they had a popularity so fierce that it would be incredibly difficult to find out which ones were mob-operated and which ones were being run by legitimate businesses, especially as pinball machines were popping up in bars, restaurants, hotels, and stores. In short, they were everywhere. 
So it came as quite the shock when New York candy store owner Jacob Murawski was arrested in 1935 over his ownership and operation of a pinball machine, which he was offering small prices to the highest scorers for. The cops said that pinball was a game of chance, making this illegal gambling. Murawski countered that pinball was a game of skill, no different from golf. To prove it, he offered to scour the city to assemble a team of what he considered to be New York's greatest pinball players, who would demonstrate their skill before the court. The judge agreed. There's little known about the three players that came to demonstrate their skill, only that a New York Times article claimed that all three were considered to be, quote, successful shooters of the little ball. However, this would not be substantiated in the courtroom. None of them were able to achieve what would be considered a good score. To make matters worse for the defense, a police officer also was able to match their scores, while saying that he had hardly ever touched one of the machines before that moment. The court ruled against Murawski. But while this may have been a victory for the prosecution, it would turn into something far greater, especially as a mayor was hoping to win some political points. Pinball would become illegal as a result of then New York City Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia's desire to outlaw what was seen to be gambling, as well as taking down a potential mob's dream of revenue. He had actually already shut down a different form of mob money making when he stopped their control over New York's artichoke industry, which could be a whole episode unto itself. And while law enforcement and civic groups looked down on pinball for its gambling and organized crime connections, churches and school boards also argued that it corrupted the morals of America's children by encouraging them to steal coins, skip school in order to play, and even go hungry by wasting their money on the frivolous pursuit. You see, most kids relied on their parents' money to play, and some would use their lunch money to play instead of eating lunch at school. Kids going hungry to play a machine at an arcade was not a good image for these games. Another concern from parents was that their kids would skip school to try and make some money. If the scrutiny of gambling with these machines wasn't enough to rally people against the games, World War II would add the fuel to the fire. In 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and America was sucked into the fight that had been raging since 1939. This just added to the hatred toward pinball machines, as it was seen as a waste of time. To make things worse for the industry, people argued that the materials the tables were made from would instead be put to more use if they were helping the war effort, including copper, aluminum, and nickel, all very widely used across pinball machines. Mayor LaGuardia thought that it was his patriotic duty to ban and confiscate pinball machines so that the metals used in their production could be more usefully diverted into making bullets and bombs for the war effort. Starting in New York, the mayor had outlawed the game. This policy led to over 2,000 machines being confiscated on the same day the ban went into effect in 1942. While some of the materials were stripped from the machines, including famously the wooden legs, which police would turn into clubs, the rest were towed to the ocean where they were tossed from Long Island Sound. Raids and seizures of pinball machines throughout major cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, Milwaukee, and New Orleans had taken place after New York's policy. In fact, it wasn't until 1976 that the New York City pinball ban was overturned. The coin-operated amusement lobby, which represented the pinball industry among others, eventually succeeded in earning a city council hearing to re-examine the long-standing ban. Their strategy? Proved that pinball was a game of skill, not chance and thus should be legal. To do this, they once again decided to call in the best player they could find in order to demonstrate his pinball mastery. That was a 26-year-old magazine editor named Roger Sharp. Fearful that this hearing might be their only shot at overturning the ban, the industry brought in two machines one to serve as a backup in case any problems arose with the primary machine. Suspicious that the pinballers had rigged the primary machine, one particularly antagonistic councilman told them that he wanted them to use the backup instead. Despite Sharp being very familiar with the first choice of game, he had never played the backup. But as he played the game, surrounded by a huddle of journalists, cameras, and councilmen, he told them that he would prove his skill by deliberately launching the ball down the center of the machine. He pulled the plunger to launch a new ball, pointed at the middle lane at the top of the playing field, and boldly stated that, based on his skill alone, he would get the ball to land through the middle lane. He let go of the plunger, and it did as he said. Almost on the spot, the city council voted to overturn the ban. 
most cities were soon to follow, and although many establishments would go on to proudly display their pinball machines for years after, the pinball industry wouldn't enjoy a boom for long, peaking in 1979 with the sale of 200,000 machines. Three years later, after games like Pac-Man, Space Invaders, and other major arcade games were released, sales of the pinball machines had declined by over 85%. Although, in an odd twist, some places never got around to making pinball legal again. In 2004, Nashville, Tennessee overturned its ban on children under 18 playing or standing within 10 feet of a pinball machine. And Ocean City, New Jersey still has a law in the books against playing pinball on Sundays. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.